Welcome to the Three Martini Lunch. Grab a stool next to Greg Corumbus of Radio America and Jim Garrity of National Review. Three Martinis coming up. Hey, really glad you're with us for the Wednesday edition of the Three Martini Lunch. Good, bad, crazy martinis for you as usual. And if you've been a longtime listener to the Three Martini Lunch, you will not be surprised at all what our good martini is today. Not just one major terrorist dead, Jim. We've got two major terrorists dead. First of all, Ismail Hanaya, the political leader of Hamas, killed in an overnight strike in the Iranian capital of Tehran. According to Iranian state-run media, so take that for what it's worth, a strike against the place where he was staying in North Tehran was around 2 a.m. and involved an airborne guided projectile. Iran's new president was sworn in on Tuesday. How's that for a first in office? And Hamas released pictures the same day of Hanaya meeting with Iranian officials in Tehran. Uh, Israel's military says it does not respond to reports in foreign media, though senior officials have previously vowed to eliminate Hamas and its leadership in response to the group's October 7th attack on Israel. Meanwhile, Israel is taking responsibility for the death of longtime Hezbollah military commander Fuad Shakur, uh, who it blamed, Israel blamed, for the deadly attack in the Golan Heights over the weekend, which killed 12 kids playing soccer. And this guy wasn't just responsible for that attack. It's being pointed out by a lot of different people today. Fuad Shakur assisted in bombing the U.S. Marine Corps barracks in Beirut, Lebanon, 41 years ago that killed 241 Americans. It's apparently the single deadliest day for the Marine Corps since the Battle of Iwo Jima. So good riddance to that scumbag. So, Jim, what do you make of uh, this significant addition to the obituary column in the terrorist world this week? Well, you know, I'm as sad as anybody else to see an austere religious scholar uh, get whacked uh, like this. Uh, I, I don't want to get people's hopes up, but just right before we started taping, don't know, know how much stock to put into this, but apparently uh, there are unconfirmed reports from Syria that Brigadier General Amir Ali Hajizadeh, uh, I'm probably mispronouncing that, commander of the aerospace forces of the Iranian Re- Revolutionary Guard Corps was killed in an attack near the Syrian capital, Damascus. IRGC is obviously uh, Qasem Soleimani's old crew, uh, kind of the terrorist arm of the Iranian state. And I just so conceivably, you could see three prominent leaders of Iranian military groups or Iranian backed terrorist groups killed within a 24 hour period. If your reaction lasts more than four hours, please see a doctor. Um, so we'll see how uh, if this this last one pans out. Obviously, anytime a terrorist assumes room temperature, as the late Rush Limbaugh used to say, it's good news. This is kind of shocking. And, and I think. Because uh, this is, guy, you know, the head of Hamas is the guy they've wanted since October 7th. And it's been a, you know, relentless hunt for this guy. Reportedly, he traveled with hostages around him as a human shield to make it less likely that he would be killed in an airstrike. But there's actually, like, in addition to being good news, there's a really intriguing mystery to this. Um, the, the fact that the Israelis killed the non-Tupac Shakur uh, figure was pretty much straightforward. It's a drone strike. There aren't that many. By the way, Anthony Blinken came out and said it wasn't us. Okay, I don't think anybody was suspecting you, Anthony. I, I think we all kind of knew Biden team was never going to have the uh, the cojones to pull off something like this. But the strike against uh, the head of Hamas in, in Tehran or in Iran, it's being reported as an assassination. For what it's worth, the Israelis came out and said it wasn't us. I, I've heard people say, ah, you know, the Israelis have denied responsibility for assassinations in the past. And that is accurate. But it seems weird that say, oh, yeah, it was totally us nailing the guy from Hezbollah. But we had nothing to do with the guy who was from Hamas. So we've said we wanted to kill for, for seven months. It just seems weird that they would issue a false denial about that one. Now, Greg, I've heard some people insisting that Hanaya was, relatively speaking, the moderate in Hamas circles, which probably tells you a bit more about uh, Hamas circles than you ever need to know that, you know, the other ones were literally rabid and foaming at the mouth. And thus, by this standard, he was the, the moderate. Was this a rivalry? Was this somebody in Iran who was looking at this guy and saying, you, you've you run this place to the ground. You, you've bit off a lot more than you could chew. Kind of mysterious, kind of strange of who, if it wasn't the Israelis, and it certainly wasn't us, then who was it? And there was a, a discussion in the NR Slack, you know, a question like, you know, we have word from the Iranian government that he was assassinated. We don't have any actual, it's like we have any video. It's not like we have any site of a, a you know, footage of a site of a drone strike or, or anything like that. 
so was he even assassinated? And my reaction to that was Greg was like, I'm pretty sure it wasn't his cholesterol. I uh, <laughs> look like he was in good shape. I don't, I slip in the shower and like these things happen, but it just seems very unlikely that natural causes or a really unexpected accident would be the cause for, uh, because for this, uh, for, for his uh, seemingly untimely death. So my suspicion is somebody killed him. The question is, was it us or was it bizarrely uh, somebody else who's not on our side who either was tired of him and saw him as a liability or worsening problem or rivalry or, you know, these guys are kind of a bunch of hotheads. It's not, you know, like one one guy says something to another, things get heated and before you know it, there's blood on the floor. So uh, we will learn more as we go. But honestly, the world became a safer place because not one but two prominent terrorist leaders dying, one under not so mysterious circumstances. It was the drone. The drone in the in the conservatory with the candlestick, um, and the other one we don't know. This one is maybe it was Professor Plum all along. Could be. Interestingly, uh, when you look at this, Jim, uh, obviously it's it's good news that they're gone. Could there be escalation? Yes. Uh, if Hamas is fuming, Iran is fuming. They've raised their red rage flag or whatever they call it on top of one of their most prominent mosques there. So uh, I'm sure they're gonna probably try to do something here. Uh, but in terms of uh, Fouad Shakur, yes, it's great that he's gone, but I'm kind of mad that he lived this long. Once the bombing of the U.S. Marine Corps barracks in, in Beirut happened in 1983, regardless of what Reagan's policy decision was, which was ultimately to remove the Marines, he basically should have gone to Bill Casey at the CIA. And I don't know if you want to be like De Niro doing Al Capone in Untouchables or Hans Gruber to Carl hunt that little down and basically everybody involved with this needs to be dead in the next six months. And so uh, didn't quite turn out that way, but uh, justice finally done. Indeed. And uh, look, you know, things can get pretty dark in this world. You know, there are a lot of days we have a lot more bad martinis and crazy martinis. But um, hey, there are bad people getting killed. That always brings a smile to my face. All right, Jim, on to our bad martini now. And for that, we go to the great state of Arizona. Battleground state for the presidential race. Been a battleground state for a while now. And the Republican Party in Arizona has an unblemished record over the past several years of constantly stepping on rakes. And they've done it again in the U.S. Senate Republican primary. Kerry Lake, who is running neck and neck in popularity with Ebola, uh, is the Republican nominee for 2024 to take on Ruben Gallego. This is an open seat. Kirsten Cinema currently holds it. She's not running for re-election after briefly exploring a run as an independent. Uh, the Democratic Party really, really hates her. So Kerry Lake, uh, as of last night, with about 75% of the uh, vote in, uh, had 55% of the vote. Sheriff Mark Lamb, who would have been a much better general election candidate with 39.2% of the vote. And so Kerry Lake, who voted for Obama twice, who as soon as the uh, Arizona Supreme Court uh, decision on abortion came down, suddenly became pro-choice, even though she denies it. Not really sure what she believes about anything. Uh, her refusal to uh, ever concede the governor's race from two years ago. Uh, all of this makes her extremely unpopular, yet Republicans insist on putting her in the general election against a far left guy who in Arizona should be incredibly beatable, but most likely Will not be. So in a 51-49 Senate, it'd be really nice to have a competitive Senate race in Arizona, but uh, we can't have nice things, Jim. Yeah. And you point out that, you know, here we are uh, looking at these, you know, a very tight Senate. Um, a lot of people think, oh, you know, if, if things broke the Republicans way, they could have huge gains. They've got a pretty much a gimme in West Virginia where Joe Manchin is uh, retiring and Republican Jim Justice is, you know, I, I believe he's measuring the drapes. Uh, that's not being sarcastic. Just like he, you know, it's it's a Big very yeah. Republic, you know, Republican leaning state in in statewide races, particularly when Trump is atop the ticket. Uh, he's got the lovable bulldog, you know. So there were two Democrats who kept screwing up the agenda of the Biden. One was Manchin, and the other one was Kirsten Cinema. And instead of we can't keep Cinema, apparently. But we can't even, you know, uh, because like, honestly, cinema would be such an improvement over Gallego. And yet Republicans cannot get their act together uh, and had to nominate someone who uh, botched an eminently winnable, really, all, you might even say easily winnable, the governor's race two years ago that Katie Hobbs refused to debate. And, every, you know, even liberal columnists were like, you look like a wimp. You look like you're scared. What's wrong with you? Decided just like a shortly before the election to say, if there's any McCain voters, get out. 
decide you know, very <laughs> weird move to say I'm going to discourage people. My closing message is that if you weren't with me on, if you happen to support the most popular Republican senator in this state for the last generation, get out. I don't want your support. Who does this? Whose idea? You know, like the, she knows that elections are not like golf where low score wins, right? <laughs> she knows the game is to, to to win as many votes as possible. Comes back, you know, as you laid out, even more of a big flopper, flip flopper than before. And they had another option, a sheriff, guy who's worked on uh, ill immigration issues. And he had just these, these great qualities, like um, not being Carrie Lake. And uh, nonetheless, nope, nope, got to go with her. I'm sure there are times the Democrats are very frustrated. And I was hanging out with Democratic friends who said, ah, oh, Jim, we're so, you don't understand. We don't fall in line the way Republicans do. We're, we're all free thinkers. We're all independent minded. So we're always infighting. And I'm like, people who hated <laughs> Kamala Harris look like they've been replaced by pod people. What are you kidding me? You know, <laughs> to see the kind of synchronized movement and alignment and lining up in, in, in favor of Kamala Harris, the only place you're going to find anything like that is the synchronized swimming events at the Olympics. That's the only time you're going to see that utter precision of everyone turning on a dime just like that. But th that's how Democrats see themselves, curiously. And here we are as the Republicans, and we have to nominate the least uh, appealing candidate possible. It, it is utterly maddening. Not the only case where we've seen less than ideal Senate candidates. Hopefully we've got some uh, uh, better luck and better options in other states. But in this case, the Arizona Republican Party just gave away a Senate seat. Gave away a Senate seat. Just, just totally decided we're not even going to compete. Way to go, Arizona. Way to go. Can people really not afford McDonald's? The Watchdog on Wall Street podcast with Chris Markowski. Every day, Chris helps unpack the connection between politics and the economy and how it affects your wallet. McDonald's says they're missing revenue as they have to lower their prices even more. Why? The consumers are pulling back. If things are so good, why are credit card delinquencies hitting a 12-year high? Whether it's happening in D.C. or down on Wall Street, it's affecting you financially. Be informed. Check out the Watchdog on Wall Street podcast with Chris Markowski on Apple, Spotify, or wherever you get your podcast. All right, Jim, on to our crazy martini now and the dueling border ads of Kamala Harris and Donald Trump. Kamala Harris is trying to gaslight America about her record as borders are by putting out an ad that talks about what she's for, not what she's done, and what Donald Trump is against. Basically, she's taking this Senate immigration bill that uh, went nowhere uh, this summer and saying that she's strongly in favor of all this stuff and Donald Trump is blocking it. Donald Trump, who's not even in the Senate. But um, here is uh, here's, uh, the Kamala Harris border ad. We'll get to the Trump one a little bit later. On the border, the choice is simple. Kamala Harris supports increasing the number of Border Patrol agents. Donald Trump blocked a bill to increase the number of Border Patrol agents. Kamala Harris supports investing in new technology to block fentanyl from entering the country. Donald Trump blocked funding for technology to block fentanyl from entering the country. Kamala Harris supports spending more money to stop human traffickers. Donald Trump blocked money to stop human traffickers. Kamala Harris prosecuted transnational gang members and got them sentenced to prison. Trump is trying to avoid being sentenced to prison. There's two choices in this election. The one who will fix our broken immigration system and the one who's trying to stop her. Yeah. And the reason that the bill didn't go anywhere in the Senate was because it was not good from a border security perspective. It had some improvements in the asylum process, but ultimately it still had thousands of people in a day and it still would have been a, a major ongoing problem and codified instead of actually just enforcing uh, the border. And so Harris, like every other Democrat, pretending the House didn't pass a much stronger border security bill. Instead, they're trying to uh, put all their, their chips down on this failed Senate bill. Jim, uh, there's an extraordinarily short memory in uh, politics, but uh, is it this short? I'm kind of marveling that they're sitting around in the, the Harris you know, campaign, Biden turned Harris campaign headquarters. And they've got this, you know, this obvious problem of the border. And they're like, well, she wasn't really the border czar. She was the migration czar. And those migrants could have migrated anywhere. You know, maybe, maybe they're going to go to Antarctica. It didn't mean they were going to the border. Obviously, you know. Um, which I don't think was particularly persuasive, and I don't think so. They, they, like so, what? You know, like, okay, people, come on, let's 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 you know, blue sky this. Just throw out ideas. What do you got? Uh, Donald Trump's weak on on immigration. Okay, let's do that. Let's do. Let's make. Let's argue that Donald Trump, who wanted to have a moat 
and wanted to have alligators and wanted to shoot migrants in the legs when they tried to cross the border. He called for everything short of sharks with friggin' lasers on their heads, to quote Dr. <laughs> Evil. That was his vision. But we're going to argue that Donald Trump is soft on illegal immigration, right? This is like saying Joe Biden is young. This is like saying Kamala Harris is soft on giggling. This is like saying J.D. Vance wants people to be childless, okay? Like there are certain stop, call timeout, and examine someone for the, con yeah, the NFL concussion protocol because no one in their right mind would make this argument. And the idea, we're gonna run ads arguing that Donald Trump is soft on illegal immigration. You guys go ahead with that. Good luck with that. Good luck storming the castle, as they said in The Princess Bride, because that, like, like I suppose, you know, um, Obama had the old slogan, audacity of hope. I mean, this is a pretty aud audacious move, right? You know, the person who's been in charge of, the, of uh, not in charge, not the, the migration czar for the last three and a half years is gonna argue that she was tougher on illegal migration than Trump was when it went, you know, as soon as he got into office, psh, went right down. Started to creep back up again, and then COVID hit. And then obviously because of COVID, nobody's, you know, uh, out and about and trying to cross the border. There are no neuralizers for men in black. You, you cannot actually get people to forget recent history that intensely, that quickly. So on the one hand, I'm kind of like, I, I, I almost, I'm almost in awe of it. I, I cannot believe um, this is not arguing that, oh, the sky isn't blue, because sometimes the sky isn't blue. This is arguing that the sky is purple with pink polka dots and yellow streaks and, and green and orange plaid all at the same time. No, no, this is not the case. So good luck with that. Let's see how it shakes out. Meanwhile, Trump's out with a border ad, too, and it's talking about what actually happened in the last four years. This is America's border czar, and she's failed us. Under Harris, over 10 million illegally here. A quarter of a million Americans dead from fentanyl. Brutal migrant crimes. And ISIS now here. Do you have any plans to visit the border? You haven't been to the border. And I haven't been to Europe. I mean, I don't understand the point that you're making. Kamala Harris, failed, weak, dangerously liberal. Once again, Republicans have much better narrators for their attack ads, but uh, Jim, uh, that's the record she's got to run away from, and I don't know how easy it's going to be. Well, the media is going to try to help her, but uh, facts are facts. Yeah, I, and this one other thing I would note is that, you know, I, I, I look, it's entirely possible I don't look at attack ads and I don't look at campaign messaging the same way the average American does half hearing it in between during the Olympics and going and getting a snack in the kitchen and, you know, Whatever they, they test these ads, they have people like paying absolute attention. And that, maybe that's not the way the average viewer actually is consuming this media anymore. But I assume like when it's, you know, like first of all, yes, Republicans have better gravelly voiced announcers. But when it's the gravelly voice, it's like, Donald Trump didn't want to stop illegal immigrants, but Kamala Harris did. But Trump would like, who the hell is this guy? What is he uh, like? You know, he's he's not the movie phone guy. He, he doesn't, you know. I, <laughs> He never comes up and says, in a world, one man. You know, like, who, you're, you're asserting these things. The nice thing about that, that Trump ad is that it's full of quotes. It's full of her and her words and her nervous giggle when she says, I haven't been to the border and I haven't been to Europe and all that. Like, like, that's there. That's video. That, that is verifiable. I think that makes a more effective ad. I'm not 100% sure um, that, you know, th there'll be a huge distinction in that. But... Again, you know, Trump has a much simpler case to argue here, a much more obvious case to argue. And Kamala Harris goes into this election with a, you know, approval rating in the mid to high 30s. Maybe it's inched up a bit with the Kamala mania. Uh, she's brat, you know, coconut tree memes. Yeah, everything's cool. You know. But she, had that, she has that approval rating for a reason. It didn't just, it didn't just fall out of a coconut tree. Right. She is burdened by what has come before, despite the fact that she's trying to change all of her positions from before. So you know, how did that happen? Well, I think it happened because, A, uh, you know, the Biden administration put on record on, on inflation in the economy and the border and stuff overseas. It's all bad. Or there's, there's, like people aren't happy with the state of the country. The only way she might be a little bit inoculated, they point out that she actually was not, voters and focus groups didn't really blame her for inflation because they didn't really know what she did all day and what she actually, you know, was in respect. Like, so in a way that's, that's good. But the one thing you can say, yes, she had a role in this was the border migration. Um, and that's why, uh, like, like she can't dodge this. She can't say, you know, now here's, there was an alternative strategy open to her that, you know, I don't think it would have taken some guts, but she would have had to say, you know what? Yeah, there was a lot of infighting in the administration. 
I was in charge of migration. I wanted to have more authority. I couldn't get more authority. Couldn't get everybody to listen to me. And that bastard Mallorca screwed it up. And if I'm in charge, he's going to be, you know, he's going to be out on his keister on day one. Like, you know, throw him in front of the bus. You know, he, he may not like it. Other people in the Biden administration may not like it. But if that's what you need to do, the other, that's a much better argument than, oh, no, I was the border hawk all along. And it's this softy Donald Trump who loves Ill illegal immigrants. Yeah, good luck with that one. I would have fixed it, except this guy who hasn't been in office for the past four years blocked it. Yeah. Go, go, yeah, go, no. go, go, go make that argument. Uh, real quick, uh, we're expected to have a uh, Harris uh, running mate selection relatively <laughs> soon. In fact, they're going to appear next week and do this whole barnstorming across the country. And speaking of Arizona senators, Jim has decided that Mark Kelly needs a little bit of attention uh, before this uh, decision officially gets made. What'd you find out about our favorite astronaut? So I started looking into the private balloon company that is supposed to be used for aerial photography. Uh, that he bought that involved investment from Tencent, which is a major Chinese company that has ties to the Co Chinese Communist Party. And that's a story. Don't get me wrong. I do feel like it's been kind of explored. What I found that, as far as I can tell, very few people of any had, had looked at was back in, before he became a senator. But after he was an astronaut, Mark Kelly was uh, in the supplements business that he was you know, touting these vitamins and rehydration and all that stuff. And by the way, for those who know the, po the, uh, the podcast sponsors, there are a lot of fine supplements out there. There are a lot of fine vitamins out there. This one isn't one of them, okay? The other thing is like, this, this is a multi-level marketing uh, company. And you know, multi-level marketing companies are not illegal, but they very often do not work out well. And the Federal Trade Commission and other federal have said, be careful about them. This is where you buy it and then you try to sell it to all of your friends. And then all of your friends try to sell it to their, all of their friends and all that stuff. And this does not work out very well. But he does an event in China for this company, Shakely. And he drives out on a motorcycle with one American flag on one side and a Chinese communist flag on the other side. Not a great visual. And he goes out there and boy, he acts like this is the greatest thing ever. I took Shakely vitamins and the Shakely rehydration drink while in orbit aboard the space shuttle. He's pumping his fist. He says, they worked very well for me in a very demanding environment. Now it's up to you. And this is where he gets into, he's not just selling the vitamins, he's selling the franchises to people. Now it's up for you to take all of these tools that Shakley and Roger, meaning company CEO Roger Barnett, has given you and turn it into something big. Each and every one of you can create your own successful Shakley business and is the rewards from that business that will help you achieve your own dreams. Now, you know, as I do all that, it's the video, it's in, the, it's in my post column today. I put, talked about it in today's Morning Jolt. Uh, you know, it's all still up on YouTube. They haven't yanked it down yet. I've taken a lot of screenshots. But the gist, you know, like, like I'm looking at that, and right now Donald Trump is saying this kid's got talent. He knows what he's doing. He, he could, you know, this is uh, this is right up there. You know, is this disqualifying? I just want to observe. Like Mark Kelly was an astronaut. And oh, by the way, there's pictures of him in the space shuttle holding up the vitamins. Like this is just really cringe. Why? Like why is NASA being used to sell these 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 vitamins and rehydrators and all that stuff? What Tang wasn't enough? I'm just kind of left wondering. A Greg, are we paying astronauts enough? Because it just it just looks cheap and cheesy and and kind of kind of shady and sleazy. Um, uh, two, I assume because Ben Carson had the Manatech gig, he just couldn't get you know couldn't get the other ones, you know. Uh, and then just the third thing, like you know, he took a fifty five thousand dollar paid gig for uh, United Arab Emirates, and I'm just like, do you need the money that badly? Like that's my thing with Carson. Like you're a brain surgeon. Why are you out? hawking these these vitamins and, and all that kind of stuff like it just it's just unsavory it, it just is cringe inducing he looks ridiculous he sounds ridiculous i'm sure he looks at it as an embarrassing moment now but this is 2015 this is not like ancient history oh I, you know i needed money for college and i was you know selling things door to door or something like that and the other thing is like he's all cashing in on his uh history in the military and his his status as an astronaut and we, the taxpayers, paid for all that training and to give him this status and to give him this extraordinary uh, experience. And then he turns around and he's hawking vitamins. You know, like, the conclusion is, is that for a stretch of his life, Senator Mark Kelly was for sale. And he was willing to sell it to some really shady people in order to, you know, make a quick buck. Now, if people want to say, ah, Trump University, Trump Stakes, Trump Water, I'm not going to. Uh, fine. It's fine. But I'm pretty sure I thought Democrats were supposed to be better than this. I thought Democrats were supposed to be setting a bar higher. And so if, you, if, if Democrats are comfortable with that, fine. Don't come to me then and then say, oh, you know, Mark Kelly is the greatest guy and, 
and all that kind of stuff. So I, anyway, watch the video. It, it'll just leave you cringing. It, you're, you're, it will cringe so in, you, you may pull a muscle from cringing. That's how, that's how it, I should put it with, with a slight, you know, you know what's really good for those cringing? Shackley Vitamins! Well, if he does end up on the ticket, I think we can chalk it up to Obama. If those stories uh, from a few mm. days ago are correct, that uh, he held off on endorsing Kamala because his initial plan was to make Mark Kelly the candidate. And so if she puts him on the ticket, that might uh, smooth some things over. We should, but we should also point out, Greg, that she's supposed to announce it next Tuesday in Philadelphia. Now, you hear that, like, oh, she's doing it in Pennsylvania. That sounds like a Josh Shapiro circumstance. So one of two things are going to happen. She's either going to pick Josh Shapiro, and it'll be what everybody expects, or she doesn't pick Josh Shapiro while announcing it in Philadelphia, and I assume he's going to be there. And we've all seen the Oscars where like everybody expects somebody to win and then they don't win and they have to force the smile and act like they're really happy for the other one. My favorite, I believe, was it Samuel L. Jackson one year who just like swore and you're just like, okay, Sam, we get you. We, we, we feel you. You know, we've all been there. Thank you for your honesty. Um, and Shapiro's got to be there. Yeah, Mark Kelly. Yes. You know, space shuttles. We, you know, um, and, and so my suspicion is the pick is Shapiro. If it isn't, Everybody's going to think, God, what scandal does Josh Shapiro have in his closet? It's a good question. I have a hard time believing Samuel L. Jackson would, would curse, though. That, that just doesn't <laughs> Actually, like he, he cleaned up his language and just said, snakes on a plane. Jim Garrity, National Review. I'm Greg Columbus of Radio America. Thanks for being with us today. Please subscribe to the podcast if you don't already. Tell your friends about us as well. Thanks also for your five-star ratings and your kind reviews. Please keep those coming. They really do help us. Get us on your home devices. All you have to say is play Three Martini Lunch Podcast. Follow us both on X. He's at Jim Garrity. I'm at Dateline underscore DC. Have a terrific Wednesday and join us again on Thursday for the next Three Martini Lunch.